Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucian. Most of you know me from X as Triangle Investor. Today, we are covering new uranium story, an exploration company, early stage, but with some impressive land holdings of more than 3,000 square kilometers in the Athabasca Basin. The name of the company is Stellian Uranium, and the name of the CEO is Drew Zimmerman. Drew, welcome to my show for the first time. I'm looking forward to this chat. I'm very much looking forward to it as well, and thank you for having me on. Thanks. Uh, let's start with your background. As I am aware, you are coming from the brokerage world. Uh, how did you end up at the helm of Stallion? Yeah, I spent almost a decade at a national brokerage firm here in Canada. Uh, my final role there was a derivatives portfolio manager, very focused on the commodity space, the global macro thematic and uh, three years ago, or over three years ago now, um, the opportunity came up to jump over the other side of the street, uh, as they say, mm -hmm. but really to be able to work with a good team, uh, get some good shareholders behind us, and, and be able to run a company and, and really build something. And uh, I think that was what was really impressive to me was the opportunity to be able to build a company. Um, and again, as, as everybody says in the junior space, you know, be able to work with good people and a good team um, just made it a really exciting opportunity to take on a new challenge and sort of a, a leap of faith. But absolutely love the fact that I did it and uh, don't regret it in any way. Excellent. Uh, your Uranium Explorer, 18 million market cap. How are you looking at the current valuation of your company? Uh, pre-recording here but uh, it's interesting to see that you see you know the big developers or the producers at, <clears throat> at all-time highs but the the juniors are really struggling to get a bid and I think that comes down to investor confidence and maybe investor confidence in the in the whole economy yeah. you know interest rates still staying high but I think the confidence is building and should be building in the uranium sector we continue to get better headlines with you know, big reactors getting their life extended, new reactors getting built. So it's a sector that has like a very, very good outlook for the next decade, if not a couple of decades. And when you realize that that's going to happen, I think that should instill confidence for the investors to start to move into the smaller caps that are sort of the beginning of the pipeline that's going to be needed for the uranium uh, that we have to have for uh, all these sort of build outs that we have uh, seen coming. So I, I think it's it's a bit of a disconnect right now. Um, I mean, right now with gold prices running high, everybody says, oh, there's a big disconnect again between commodity price and uh, <laughs> the producers. And, and those disconnects happen. But again, as we've learned over time, they're not forever. So they do present opportunities. And, and that's what everybody always looks for as an investor is those disconnects to position yourself to get in. And then when you're proven to be right, it, it becomes uh, very fruitful for you. Yeah, definitely agreed on the disconnect. There is a disconnect at the moment, uh, like you and I talked before. Okay, I usually ask about the team in the later part of my interviews, but I believe that understanding your story better, we should cover that first. So who are the people behind Stallion and how are they all involved in the story? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm fortunate to have you know three very large shareholders that have had a lot of success in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, they're almost 30% of, of our company, so very big shareholders in that size. Um, but they were the group that uh, founded and put together Hathor Exploration. So they found the Rough Rider deposit that sold to Rio Tinto for uh, $650 million in 2012. Yeah. Obviously, a very big success for, for them and for shareholders of Hathor. And then they vended in land assets to both NextGen and now more recently, uh, AFSA Energy, and are big shareholders there as well. So they know how the Athabasca Basin operates. They know how to... You know, build a company, find a discovery, and create a lot of shareholder value. So, for us to be able to lean on on them is an incredible, you know, building block. And again, with the strategy that we've had coming into the basin with such a big land package, it's knowing that we can create a tremendous amount of value in you know two years, three years, five years, not the next three months or four months. So when you have shareholders that you know have been there and done that. And they give you that sort of leeway to say, go out and find the next big deposit. We know it's going to take a couple of years, 
but we think the valuation that you can get out of that is absolutely tremendous and worth the wait. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, can you name me some people who are in your team? Yeah, and I mean, that's the other important part, the operational side. So uh, last summer, we added Darren Slagowski as our VPX in Canada. Uh, he spent seven years with Pierpoint Uranium. So again, very focused on the Southwest Athabasca Basin. That's what really made him stand out uh, for us. Uh, local Saskatchewan guy, farm kid, which I, I love because uh, we have a lot of work in front of us and, and you can't be afraid of uh, putting in a little elbow grease. And we've definitely been leaning pretty heavily on him with the amount of work that we've done mm -hmm. uh, since bringing him on. And then at the beginning of this year, we also added Matt Schwab to our board. So the technical expertise there, one of the first employees with Next Gen Energy uh, Instrumental with the aero discovery and building that out and actually had worked on the resource at, at uh, Rough Rider for Hathor as well. So yeah. a lot of experience in the basin to be able to have those two put their heads together, work with all the data that we're getting and lining up the ability to find that next deposit. So, you know, that expertise to say, this is what we're looking for. We've been there, we've done that. And let's follow those same steps and do it again. Mm -hmm. Matthew is also CEO of Kraken Energy, right? Yes, he is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, he's a uh, CEO of Kraken Energy down in the United States. Uh, and then we're the only company that he's involved with uh, up in the Athabasca Basin. And again, when we uh, approached him to, to come on the team, you know, he was very excited. I mean, very excited about the land package that we've been able to put together and the probability and prospectivity that it has. So, yeah, very, very excited to have brought him on. Uh, one other intriguing name uh, on your board is Jay Martin. Uh, I'm especially interested to hear how did Jay end up in your team? I have a big respect for Jay. Great guy, uh, great conference maker, great interviewer. But I'm curious, what is the what is his role in the company? I would presume networking and people. Yeah, absolutely. As you say, I mean, Jay puts on the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference here in Vancouver. Uh, an absolutely tremendous conference. I mean, Jay, uh, similar to me, was presented with this opportunity right from the very beginning uh, to come on and, and be a board a board member and, and help build the company. Um, and as you said, I mean, when you're at the level that Jay's at in the resource sector, and I mean, just yesterday I was watching his live show with uh, Rick Rule and Ross Beatty. So, I mean, he's got a Rolodex in the industry that's absolutely incredible. So to be able to lean on him for videos that we've done, you know, similar to this, where we get to explain what we're doing, but also the connections that he has throughout the industry. And then also by doing, you know, continual live videos, understanding, you know, from an investor point of view, you know, what are investors looking for? What's, you know, driving their decision process. So being able to to have his thumb on that pulse and, and inform us of, you know, where do we really need to focus and hit? Um, and then introductions that can help uh, with all of that is, is Jay's role. And, you know, again, um, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by good people and Jay is definitely one of them. Yeah, Jeff, uh, Jay knows people, that is a fact. And I believe that is a big help for your company. I, I would agree on that. Okay, uh, Drew, let's cover your projects and plans for them. A majority of your projects are located on the west side of the Athabasca Basin in the neighborhood with Fission, PLN, next-gen projects. But you also have some on the eastern part like Cigar Lake East and Rough Rider South. Very intriguing names, definitely. Uh, they are in a good neighborhood with the proximity of Cigar Lake and excellent projects like Waterbury from Denison or even McLean Lake. Uh, can you give me an overview of your project and we can start with, let's say, uh, your coffer project? Yeah, um, I mean, we can go in there. First, I'll, I'll maybe touch on the eastern side just sure, because no we, we did do a transaction uh, this year. Again, as you said, we had about 10,000 hectares over three projects on the east side. And for us, our focus is the southwest. That's where we've built out our expertise. That's where we're operating. We're doing all of our work. So for us. We were able to work with uh, another group that will uh, <clears throat> sorry, sure. come back to trading shortly um, that's going to be able to bring those projects forward for us. So we were able to, to monetize. We got $400,000 in cash. We got about 10% of the issued and outstanding of that company. 
we'll actually manage the exploration for them for the first year at, at a good management fee, okay. and then have an NSR on the back end. So again, it was projects for us that we weren't going to be able to focus on. And now, you know, we've been able to monetize some of it and we still have a significant upside because again, as you said, they're in a great location, right yeah. in the heart of the Eastern Athabasca Basin. So now we can have a company that's going to be able to focus on them and actually see them move ahead, which is a great position for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the big thing for us is now we're at over 3000 square kilometers in the Southwest Athabasca Basin. So we are the biggest landholders there, you know, bigger than next gen, bigger than vision. Uh, and our whole strategy was, you know, when you look at the Athabasca Basin, exploration started, you know, in the 50s up at the very north end uranium uh, city. And then it wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s that the discoveries started to happen in the eastern side of the basin. And then everything moved to the eastern side of the basin. That's where everybody's focused really for the last, you know, 40, 50 years. Yeah. And you had the discoveries of, of Triple R and Arrow in, in 2012 and 2014. But that was the absolute worst time to have new world-class discoveries in a new corner of the basin because uranium prices were plummeting and there was no exploration boom to follow that up. So when we started to look at the basin and see where we wanted to focus, it was let's go look for these big world-class deposits that we're looking for where nobody else has looked for them, not where there's been, you know, traces of them here and there, and maybe they they missed with drilling. And, and again, that's still potential, but our whole thesis was let's start big, do regional work um, and bring it up with the best technology that we have available now. You know, if they were able to find Cigar Lake and MacArthur River 40 years ago, mm -hmm. we think we should have a huge advantage in being able to find those types of deposits now. So. That's how we set ourselves out, uh, a very big land package, but again, thinking that we can methodically and systematically work through it to increase our probability of, of discovery. Um, and that's the, the roadmap that we're on and you know, different projects are at different stages, but it's been incredibly rewarding so far. I think you know all the work that we've done to date and we've done a lot over a very big uh, piece of land in the last uh, 15 months or so. Um, but I think it's it's showing all the signs that we would want to see, uh, given the roadmap that we have. So it's it's pretty exciting. Okay, uh, can you walk me through the projects on the west side? So and uh, what work has been done so far? Yeah, so we really have, um, I guess, the easiest way to explain it, sort of a two stage, like one two of a hundred percent owned ground, mm -hmm. and then we have a very large joint venture project with Atha yeah. Energy. Um, so our 100% owned ground, we took ownership of earlier. So that was the first uh, about 80,000 hectares that we did all the regional work on. We flew VTAM over the entire land package uh, early of 2023. And now just more recently, we released the preliminary data at the beginning of this year of doing that same regional survey. This time we did mobile MT over the 2,200 square uh, kilometers of our ATHA joint venture survey. So now they've all been covered regionally, but our 100% owned ground, because it was more advanced earlier, we had some early targets that we really liked. We had three good targets on our coffer project and one really strong target on our coyote target, um, as well as some other targets on some of the smaller blocks of mm -hmm. Sandy Lake and Borderline. But our Appaloosa target really stuck out to us. So that was the target that we then went and did a, a squid time domain uh, electro survey on the ground so that, again, the best metaphor I have is, you know, if you're taking a photo from a helicopter down to the ground, if you really want to zoom in on a plant or anything like that, you know, it's going to be kind of grainy by the time you get there. So by doing an on the ground survey, it's sort of like taking a, a closer uh, snapshot or photograph of that area. So you really increase the resolution of what you're understanding. And we were able to do that uh, through the end of 2023. Um, and be able to process that data sort of over the holidays and beginning of this year to set up our maiden drill program on the Appaloosa target uh, for the beginning of this year. And that's the program that's that's currently underway right now. Um, and again, for us, we've we put out the uh, preliminary drill results of, of one drill hole and you know couldn't be more excited about the results that we got there. Um, again, we are a greenfield exploration project with not a single drill hole across this. And again, I, I emphasize that because if it was on the eastern side, it would have 
over a yeah. thousand goals and it would be tested like crazy. Um, so for us, again, our strategy of being able to put the drills on the most perspective areas we think, and we hit over 1500 counts per second was the downhole probe uh, peak reading that we got showing us that, you know, this structure that has everything that you want, it's, it's on a conductive trend. It's right by a big domain boundary. It's gravity low, magnetic low. Uh, it's only 13 kilometers away from Shake Creek. So we knew, you know, there was a hundred million pound deposit very close by. But this first hole was our sniff that said, yes, this structure also has radioactivity in it. Um, but again, it's that sniff. We obviously didn't hit a you know deposit or discovery hole yet. But again, to be able to drill our first hole and just learn so much from that, the geology, even the unconformity was uh, much shallower than we were expecting from the models that we had. So again, taking that data, reworking it into the targeting for the next two holes, um, it's a, a very exciting time to be able to finally drill tests because, again, you can do all the geophysics that you want, but you can never find a discovery without drilling. So uh, it's exciting to be at that advanced stage of exploration on, on Appaloosa. Okay. What's your plan for the remainder of 2024 when it comes to exploration work? Yeah, absolutely. So we're still in the process of our, our maiden drill program, uh, two more holes to come there. And then the other big thing for us was to say, you know, we don't want to just be a binary company of this is the best target. We need to drill it and drill it and drill it. We have what we think are going to be at least six or seven, maybe even eight, what we're calling tier one targets that would have been, you know, focused on in the 80s if they were on the eastern side of the Athabasca Basin. So it's bringing up other targets to drill readiness as well. So our 100% owned Gunter target has, uh, or Gunter project has the Coyote target on it. So we've done that, some more surveys on that. So we actually recovered it when we were doing our Atha joint venture survey. So it's, it's a lot shallower than the Appaloosa target. It's about 350 meters. So we want to have that target be drill ready um, and as an option, because if we get the results from the back of, of this uh, drilling that we're doing at Appaloosa right now, you know, it may be an area that we, you know, say, yes, we absolutely have to go back and, and follow that up. You know, we're going to have a lot more data at the end of this program. And it may also be, you know, that's still a, you know, a, a nine out of 10, but we think Coyote is now a nine and a half out of 10 and we should go drill test that area. Um, and we also want to have other, other key targets, you know, brought up to drill readiness as well. So, that's what we're going to be focusing on. I mean, we're still actually going through the processing of uh, that big Atha joint venture because, again, we had two helicopters in the air, terabytes of data coming in. Um, so we put out the preliminary results, which were incredibly exciting to see, but we still have <clears throat> a lot of processing. So uh, 2D and 3D inversions, they're going to help us uh, prioritize which target areas we want to go back and which survey is going to best assist those. Can we go straight into a ground survey? Can a, an airborne gravity survey or a ground gravity survey, you know, take us towards drill readiness? Um, what do we need to do there? So through the summer months, it's going to be, um, or the next few months, I guess we're still spring, we'll be bringing up several other targets to drill readiness as well. Okay. Have you maybe asked around about the drilling, uh, future drilling costs on your projects? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're fortunate right now, um, drilling for, call it $600 a meter, sort of all in 600. cost. 600, yeah. Um, so we're fortunate now, too, to be not using a helicopter-assisted program. It was skidded in off the trails, off the road. Yeah. You know, if we're getting a little bit further to the east, then we're, we're getting a little further away from uh, the road. So there is ways to, to take trails, and there are trails that are out there, and you can, uh, you know, adjust those a little bit. Um, so going forward, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. We are seeing, you know, a lot more exploration activity. We've seen both fission and next gen go back towards exploration drilling. Uh, obviously, F3 is doing an incredible yeah. amount of drilling as well right now, as well as some of the other junior explorers uh, in the Southwest. So again, the Southwest is seeing a lot more, but the other good thing that comes with, you know, having uh, Darren as our VPX is he's been there. He's been drilling in the Southwest Basin for the decade. You know, he's got good contacts and good availability for us. So, you know, we don't see the potential for drill prices to go up, you know, exponentially by any way, shape or form. Um, and we hope that stays the same. And with the relationships 
uh, that we have right now, we think you know we can kind of continue to use the same expertise because obviously the people doing the drilling is is just as important as all the equipment. Um, but we think that we're going to have the capacity to to do the type of drilling that we want to do. And again, we're not doing you know thirty thousand meters uh, yeah. like next gen is. We're you know taking smaller bites, but uh, at very prospective discovery of whole areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it's an, your projects are an early stage project, uh, projects with limited uh, work done over there, but are they all situated on known trends and geological corridors and uh, are they in, on the, in the right spot, so to say? Yeah, absolutely. Geologically, of course. Yeah. I, and I think that was an important shift with the recent F3 discovery uh, a year ago was, you know, when everybody looked at the Southwest, it was, okay, yeah, there's the Patterson Lake trend. And if you're not on the Patterson Lake trend, you know, what do you have really? Yeah. Nothing. Uh, you know, there's a big uh, feature called the Clearwater Domain that sort of goes through the Western side of the, the Southwest Athabasca. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of the land that, that sort of follows up the edge of both sides of, of that feature. Uh, and I think it's interesting to note that, you know, F3 is just on the north edge of it. And now you also had a, the new lightning zone from Pure Point sort of being just on the sort of southeastern side of it. So the edges of that domain boundary are, are very interesting. And we're really looking at some of the highlighted data that are coming in along the edge of that. But then you're also seeing, you know, next gen step off of the Patterson Lake corridor into the new Carter corridor and, and even further out towards our Gunter Lake project with their R7. Uh, corridor. So, you know, we're seeing these corridors as the exploration work finally starts to happen. We're seeing they really spread maybe all the way from, you know, this Clearwater Domain feature all the way to the big uh, Virgin River shear zone, which, you know, cuts all the way through the basin. It's got Cameco Centennial deposit on it. You know, one of the new highlighted areas that we're looking at is, is a sympathetic structure uh, to that big fault zone. So you've kind of got Centennial on one side, it's had you know incredibly high uh, uranium grades, about 65 million pounds there. And this new target area that we're looking at um, is sort of the, the other side of that. So the Western side of, of the shear zone. So, you know, I think it's important to one, focus in on, yes, this is the history of the models that have led to deposits. But if you were just following that, you also wouldn't have the JR zone that F3 had because, you know, yes, it's on a conductor, but it's maybe not on some of the, other features that people would have traditionally related to hosting uh, high grade deposits. So I think the potential for us to really prove out similar to what they've done in the Eastern side of the Athabasca, it's, you know, not just one region. I mean, there's uranium occurrences and deposits throughout the entire Eastern side. And we think that's the case in the West. And it just, again, hasn't had the exploration work to bring it up to prove that that's the case. And I think, again, even from an early stage, what we're seeing with, you know, that big Athos JV survey that we did, I mean, we had 560 kilometers of conductive trends. I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, a, a 10 or 12 uh, kilometer conductive trend is, is a great target zone to focus in on. So we really get to, you know, take the very best and, and cherry pick for the targets that we want to go after because we have so much opportunity. Um, but then it is, you know, take, making sure that we're advancing the structures uh, that we think, you know, have the highest probability of, of success. Um, and again, that's where our, our team and, and the history that they've done and, you know, especially Matt Schwab recently coming on to really help us go, go through that process. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the long-term strategy here for your company? I mean, you have a lot of projects for uh, for your market cap, so to say. Are you interested also to 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 have a prospect prospect generator model, or you will be a pure explorer? Yeah, I I think that's a, a difficult one because we do we have you know, and especially from our recent survey work we have more targets than we can drill test. Yeah. Um, so the potential to talk to other groups, you know, especially if we see the Iranian market really start to, to heat up again. Uh, I mean, we have had conversations with other groups. There are some ongoing, you know, we really want to be able to focus on our, our best project areas. So that, you know, clear explorer uh, business plan, okay. you know, I think especially, 
in in the West. I think if you have both Next Gen and and Fission at this point still trying to build uh, a mill with their mines that are coming online, we need bigger deposits to be found in, in the Southwest. And obviously, that's why both Fission and Next Gen are, are trying to do that themselves. Um, but the ability for a junior to come in and and find more pounds in the ground uh, would be very compelling. So you know we are looking at sort of both ways and and part of our strategy when we you know started coming into the basin over a year and a half ago when uranium was you know forty dollars a pound not a hundred dollars a pound was to be aggressive and build out a big real estate package knowing that that real estate was going to be worth more in the future and you know we think we've added a lot of value to that real estate with the surveys that we've done and sort of proven that it isn't just moose pasture like i was told a, a lot over a year ago um <laughs> So it's it's it, it'll be exciting to see what we have uh, available to us. But again, similar to what we did on the the eastern side with our non core projects, there is you know the ability to have you know cash come into the company and then still have you know significant upside for our shareholders um, with those projects moving forward is something we'll continue to evaluate. Um, but still, really wanting to do a lot of the the key exploration work ourselves. Got it. Long story short, uh, long so story short, options are open for the other projects, uh, all, all kind of options, so to say. But what about your gold assets? Uh, at uh, what stages are those projects, and do you plan to spin out the, those projects, or maybe even sell them to remain uranium sharp focus company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head with where we're at in the Athabasca Basin is is having that optionality and. Our gold projects are just another layer of that optionality. And uh, again, our our key thinking behind that, you know, all through last year was both of our, our gold projects in Idaho and Nevada are right next to incredible companies doing very good work that we're going to have some some key catalysts. Um, so obviously, you know, gold going to 2350, I think, is sort of reawoken in everybody's eyes to, yeah. you know, gold projects and gold project potentials. But both projects, I mean, even in this last week, uh, you know, I-80, which we're right next to in Nevada, just did a $100 million bot deal, uh, progressing that. They've got 7.5 million ounces in the ground, a lot of high-grade zinc, lead, and silver as well. And then in uh, Idaho, our, our flagship 4-7 project there, uh, flagship on the gold side, that is, uh, you know, they've had several key pieces of, of news as they're marching towards a draft record of decision. But you know, $60 million of Department of Defense grants. They've had an $8.5 million civil royal, royalty. And then just on Monday, they were up over 30% on the day with a letter of intent from the uh, U.S. Import-Export Bank for $1.8 billion of financing to bring that project online. So, you know, there's there's a, those catalysts that we've been calling for sort of coming to fruition now. And, and we have been in, in talks with, with different groups um, and potential to spin out and are, are looking to do something uh, near term on that because we think in the stallion structure right now, we are getting viewed for our assets and our work in the Athabasca Basin and that's where our focus is. So being able to see some valuation come to our shareholders and some opportunity to have those projects get, get pushed on and advanced more than, than what we're doing on them right now, uh, we think right now is a very you know, good time to be doing that. And we think there can be a pretty significant amount of value that can come to our shareholders uh, through some of the transactions that we're looking at right now. So hoping to be able to uh, bring something to the public uh, on that uh, in the near term, um, because again, I think it, it really helps, you know, just add to the valuation that we have uh, in stallion uranium. And again, it does clarify our message as well. You know, we've talked to some institutional funds that, you know, want to have a little bit more clarity on, you know, where all your dollars are going, where your costs are. So, you know, being able to separate out and have, you know, a gold company start off with two great assets, with a lot going on and take off and then Stallion Uranium be able to focus on, uh, you know, 100% um, with the assets and the work that we're doing in the Athabasca Basin. Got it, Drew. Okay, uh, access to capital. For me, it is a critical factor when I invest in Explorer Junior Company. How are you looking here? Can can your background help with that? I assume yes. Uh, and do you have a group of people or companies that are supporting you? Yeah, I mean, it's been uh, interesting as we've come from very greenfield projects all the way to more advanced. Uh, I think we're getting to that stage now where 
we've matured enough where some more institutional accounts are starting to look at us. You know, we have an ongoing drill program, future drill programs coming. You know, I, I'm very fortunate that we have good access to capital that allowed us to do the work that we did over the last 14 months. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, getting us ready to be at the advanced stage that we're at now and really being able to focus in on the highest probability areas. So for us, you know, we've got great relationships we're both here in Vancouver and it, it has been, you know, a, a very retail held story. I mean, I would say that, you know, our, our big shareholders are more on the institutional size and level. Um, but outside of that, you know, the ability for institutions and some funds to, to start stepping in um, and, and really help us is, is definitely on our radar right now. Um, you know, we were fortunate we raised $3.9 million in February that, you know, fully funded our, our drill program as well as, we, as being able to bring up uh, another couple targets to drill readiness um, and then still have, you know, a million dollars in the bank on the hard dollar side, which is, you know, important for companies in Canada because we do have, uh, you know, charity flow through and flow through dollars that needs to be spent on exploration and then the hard dollars that uh, does everything else to keep the company going. So, we're in a good position now to, to be able to, you know, evaluate all of our assets uh, and target areas and see where we want to focus. And, and then the good thing is if we do go to do a, a bigger raise, you know, those dollars are going into drilling, you know, a very high probability uh, target that could make a discovery. And again, it's always emphasizing, you know, a year ago, F3 uranium was a, a 20 million market cap. It's now 200 million on the yeah. back of a discovery hole. And, and even at a bigger level, I like to, to tell people, you know, Bill Gates is law. Of, you know, we always overestimate what we can do in one year and greatly underestimate what we can do in 10. You know, 10 years ago, almost to the month, Next Gen was a little discovery company like we are. And now they're a $6 billion development company. So, uh, you know, the area that we're in and the deposit types that we're going after is is it's truly incredible, you know, the value that can be created there with the discovery hole. And I think we've taken such a big systematic uh, strategic sort of approach of going through it. We just continue to increase our probability. And that's all we're trying to do as, as the management team is say, how do we most effectively and efficiently go after the best targets? And, and I think we've been able to do that. And just, again, being able to present that to the market and our shareholders so that they they see what their dollars are doing and and the potential that those dollars have. Yeah, uh, it's, it looks like you are ticking all the right boxes. So you have the land, you have the fine, you are fully financed, uh, fully funded for for drilling, for exploration, uh, exploration campaign. You you will have, uh, but you need maybe you need to tell the story. Let's say a little bit better. Uh, what is your strategy here on marketing side? How can you get the story out more and better, so to say. Yeah, that's always uh, an interesting proposition for junior companies. It's, you know, if you have, uh, it's sort of the, if the tree falls in a forest and nobody hears it, did it, did it fall type thing. So it's it's one of those things where you need to make sure you're going to, you know, conferences, getting your name out there with, you know, the institutional circles. Uh, also, you know, utilizing um, these videos, getting people more aware on, on social yeah. media, um, content creation is is always you know king I think right being able to have a lot of content that people can absorb and see what you're doing Agreed. you know the news flow cycle um, and then it's also a balancing act of you know you don't want to blow your budget on marketing because you could be spending that on you know putting dollars into the ground um, so it's always a, a fine line of yes we need to go out there and, and do a lot of marketing because that helps us raise the capital that helps our, our share price do better helps us get that that interest um, but you don't want to go overboard on that side of things so for us it's really trying to you know utilize a, a bunch of different uh, vectors to be able to do what we think is is working and resonating with people um, and, it, and it is just signed up for our news releases that go out uh, when they go out and um, so that's really been sort of the mantra of 
how I present the company and, and what we're doing is, you know, you don't need to put huge extrapolations on what's happening. You just tell a factual story from the uranium sector right down to uh, how we, we go about getting to our, our, our drill testing and what that drill testing can, can bring for investors. Fair enough. Uh, you said you have 3.9 million in the till. Yeah, not anymore. That was back in the beginning of February, and obviously we're uh, okay. Yeah, you through, raised three point uh, nine million, and you spent yeah. a little bit on the on the exploration. But uh, like you said, you are fully covered for twenty twenty four. Yeah, not fully covered for twenty twenty four, probably. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, we could call it uh, continue on all the way through twenty twenty four. You know, if we want to get a little bit more aggressive, so the. Sure. I mean, we had a little, we had over a million dollars in the company coming into that financing, two million for the drill program. We kind of earmarked another million for bringing up uh, targets, and that still leaves us with over a million dollars in the bank as well. So, again, in this market, it's it's not all about just what you can do. It is uh, about what's happening in the broader market and and where capital is available and liquidity. Um, so being able to be opportunistic, you know, that's why we took advantage of the the financing in February because the market was doing very well and, and we had the, the good use of proceeds. We wanted to be able to go out and drill test Appaloosa, which we were able to get set up. Um, so we're willing to be, uh, you know, opportunistic in that sense again, you know, let the market kind of build a little bit. We've still got a lot of work that we can do to, to bring things up, to be ready for more targets to get drill tested. Mm -hmm. And if the market really starts to go, then we want to be able to launch another drill program that, that would take another financing because again, those are, uh, pretty expensive events, but at the same time, expensive events that have, you know, tremendous amount of upside potential to them. So, you know, as an investor, those are the types of financings that I think you want to get in on because those dollars uh, are going to very prospective things. Okay, maybe some money comes from uh, options or exercising warrants. Uh, how is your share structure looking? Yeah, share structure, we're 123 million shares out right now. Uh, the options and warrants that we have are, you know, above where we are right now. So there's there's no near term exercise uh, okay. that we'd be looking at on that front. So again, it would be more of a traditional uh, equity raise at, at this point. But again, I think it's important when you see the potential of what can happen with uh, a discovery hole. And and again, we still have two holes uh, yet to be announced uh, on the current program. And, and then again, those can be, you know, additional accesses to capital uh, once you get through those option prices or, or warrant prices um, that are out there. So I think we have about 16 million warrants outstanding uh, right now and at considerably higher prices. I think they're around 36 cents and 40 cents. Um, so a lot better uh, than where we're priced at the moment. So uh, again, nothing that would be imminent, um, but yes, they are there for down the road uh, financing available. Okay. okay, okay. What about skin in the game? I know that the window uh, for you to invest in the company is very narrow. Uh, you can do it when you are exp when you are drilling, when you have news coming, etc. How is the skin in the game looking for your company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I came uh, into this company um, at the beginning um, after the very first financing. So I've been building up my equity position as we go. Um, you know, we've been drilling for the last little while, so haven't been participating. But when we first uh, traded lower, um, you know, I was buying in the market at, at 16 and 14 cents um, because I just see tremendous value there. Uh, I, I put a, a tweet out to that effect, I'm not a huge following on Twitter, so it doesn't get seen. But again, when you think that, you know, all the pieces of our company could be sold off for, you know, way above where our market cap is, and that's without factoring in any, you know, discovery success, uh, you know, I think it's a, a tremendous bargain right now. So I've continued to build my position. And then with our, our board, you know, tying our, our management again, bring in Darren Slagowski, uh, you know, farm kid out of Saskatchewan was not, hey, we're bringing him in because he's got millions of dollars coming with him. We're bringing him in because he's a tremendous geologist who's willing to work his ass off and will incentivize him and, and myself with option packages. And, and again, when options are above the market, you know, we need to see more success uh, in our stock price. Um, to be able to have, you know, the management really start to benefit from that. So I think that helps align the interests uh, with shareholders. 
you know, we, we don't give out uh, RSUs. It's, it is all options. So if our shareholders are benefiting from a higher stock price, then the management will as well. Mm -hmm. um, and again, trying to just continue to build up our position in a, in a company that we think has a lot of potential and, you know, a few things turn for us and, you know, a couple upcoming catalysts, the, the gold optionality, as well as the ongoing drilling and, you know, things could get uh, very exciting very quickly uh, as they, they have in junior exploration, that's for sure. Definitely. Final question, Drew, uh, more M&A for the company? If yes, I mean, you buying other assets or staking more land. If yes, uh, what kind of projects uh, or places are you targeting? Yeah, I mean, for us, we really like the Southwest Athabasca. So we've been focused there. Uh, one of the benefits we got to do was, you know, having that big Athabasca joint venture survey came back with with a lot of data and uncovered key target areas that were just unknown. So we were able to stake what we're calling our Upper Mirror River project, 100% uh, owned, 31,000 hectares, to cover the extensions of what we started to uncover from that uh, joint venture survey. So again, when you're a first mover in an area, you have data that nobody else has. So we've been able to take advantage of that, uh, stake a little bit of extra ground. You know, we are looking at, uh, other staking opportunities that that come up in the basin. Again, it's a, a very effective way to build the land package and, and target area. Um, so we are looking at some of that, you know, always talking to the other juniors as well. I mean, we've seen some consolidation in the space with Atha Energy and uh, Latitude and 92 Energy finally, uh, I think fully coming together now at this point as of even this morning I saw. So. You know, it'll be interesting to see if, if more consolidation happens in that space, if we need, you know, the junior explorers to have a larger market cap than, uh, you know, 20 million market cap that, that a lot of them are at right now. Um, but again, it's, it's something that, you know, we're always, we're always open. I think as, as an explorer or as an exploration company, if you start, you know, putting the horse blinders on and get too focused on one thing, you can miss a tremendous amount of value. So, uh, whether that's in an exploration sense or at a company management level of how we look at different opportunities, you know, we want to keep the, the horse blinders off, eyes wide open at, you know, anything that, that makes sense for us and for our shareholders. That is the right approach. Uh, okay, that was Jules Zimmerman. Uh, thank you very much for coming to my show and I wish you luck with all your projects and the exploration that you have going forward. Thank you very much. Yeah, Luca Jan, thank you very much for having me on. Some great questions and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.